Hi guys, it's Blackie. Okay. Say a month or so ago, but maybe two months ago, I did a video talking about the kit gun. And I was talking about the uh, Heritage Rough Rider as it being the, basically the modern interpretation of a kit gun. Now for those of you that don't remember the video, what it is is when I was growing up, you see a lot of these guns that were used as a carry-along gun. It was the gun you took fishing. It was the gun that you carried when you were going for a hike or whatever, where you were not actively hunting or something, so you didn't bring a bigger gun. But you wanted to carry something with you, something small, easily compact, quick and easy, that I was going to be able to pot, you know, like a rabbit, a squirrel, something that presented itself at close range, a quick target that I could harvest quickly and cleanly to take home for a quick meal or on camping to have something with me. Quite often you carried snake shot in it when fishing or whatever to take care of that moccasin that took great exception to be, you being on his pond and things like that. That was the kit gun. It went with the camping kit. It went with the truck kit. It went with the fishing kit. Many times you'd open up the tackle box and land on top would be this small little compact 22 loaded with snake shot for defense against snakes. So it was the it was the companion piece, okay? And the um, when I was a boy, you saw a lot of those. But I I came in in the 60s during the transition, <clears throat> and what I mean by that is the gun that kind of in many ways brought an end to the kit gun. Um, a lot of the old guys carried those little swing out Smith and Wesson revolvers. Now there was a lot of other guns as well. Colt made small 22s and then of course you had a lot of other foreign makes that were cheaper made and were of dubious quality. The H&R revolvers, that small compact that you had to unscrew the base pin and pull it out to drop the cylinder out and then punch out your empties. Almost like a storekeeper model. Were very available and very profitable and many people carried those but this gun as it came on the scene you know before me actually during the 50s it really kind of made big inroads into that kit gun and kind of was the death knell for kit guns in many ways and the gun i'm talking about is that is the ruger standard today we call it the mark one this is actually a mark two but when it came on the scene, you got to back up and understand a little bit of the concept here. When World War I occurred, it was the first time a lot of doughboys had ever seen or heard of a Luger pistol. They had been available. Heck, the U.S. Army had even did field trials before adopting 1911. They looked at a 45 Luger. But it hadn't caught on that much. And it was not a cheap gun. It was a, more of an upper level price range gun at the time, certainly during the Great Depression. <clears throat> and so bringing home a Luger as a war trophy was big. A lot of people knew about them, had seen pictures, write-ups about them, pictures and things like that. And so many people desired a Luger. Couldn't get them. World War II happened, and them boys went over, and now they're fighting 1911s, and they saw all kinds of handguns, and a lot of those handguns came back as war trophies. A few of them were Lugers, but since the German army had kind of got away and gone to the P-38 and other calibers and a lot of other different guns, the Luger was sort of a secondary at that time. It was still a very prestigious gun, but Lugers were kind of finicky in their ammunition and they had to be kept clean because of their old toggle action that they had. So in 1947 when Bill Ruger and Strum formed Strum Ruger and Company or Ruger Strum, Strum Ruger I'll get it right in a minute but they formed that company. Strum was the money man, Ruger was the design man and so he designed the standard. Okay, Now it was a Ruger and yet the silhouette, especially the old taper barrel, and let me put a picture of that in right here. Looks a lot like a Luger, don't it? So it was named Ruger, sounds like Luger, looks like a Luger, but it's a 22, and it's in a price range that's 50-something, 60-something bucks when it was new, back in those days. 
that put it within reach. And so a lot of the kit guns, now it was competitive with the kit guns as far as in price range. And you could have an automatic instead of a little a revolver with five or six. You could have a 10-shot automatic that looked like a Luger. Today we'd call it clickbait, but old Bill Ruger, he was clicking all them buttons, wasn't he? It looked like a desirable war collectible. It was cheap to shoot. It was in a price range that many of the people of the day could afford, and it was rugged and reliable. Clickbait City, he did successful. And so when I was coming up, I saw a lot of these guns floating around, but it was, you'd have the older guys had the revolvers, and some of the younger guys had these for kit guns, okay? And so it really was sort of the the death knell for the revolver kit gun. Now, of course, many of the cheaper ones hung in. But the Smith & Wessons, their prices got higher and higher as the cost of production went up. So that whenever I was in there in the early 70s, they were way beyond my price range. I couldn't afford to purchase a actual Smith & Wesson kit gun or one of the little Colt guns. I had to get a, a $50 FIE Buffalo Scout single action, which the Ruger, the um, Heritage Rough Rider is the modern take on that. But this gun, I had a Colt Woodsman that I got in a trade, but this gun was one of the most desirable guns to me coming up because it was had become sort of the kit gun of that day. Now this one is a Ruger Mark II. And for those of you not familiar with the design, it is a blowback design, which means the bolt comes straight back like that. It has a heel type magazine release. You push down and the magazine comes out. It holds 10 rounds. Again, like a Luger. The Lugers had a heel type release as well. Now in later models they would make a push button up here to allow it to come out like a 1911 or what we Americans think. It's got a safety right here. Now this is a bull barrel, a heavy target pistol with great big sights that old guys like me can see these sights. This was made up from the beginning to be a very accurate target pistol for shooting, hunting, etc. And my good friend Micah bought this gun brand new, brand new 40 years ago. It's still his kit gun to this day. When he goes out and he's going to be walking around his land, go down the pond just to take a look at it, whatever, this goes on his hip. After 40 years, it's still his preferred kit gun to just carry on him when he's walking in and out. And I greatly appreciate Micah for loaning me this because it was like giving up his firstborn <laughs> to let me borrow it because of the fact he knows I'll take care of it, but still, it's that dear a gun to him, that dear companion to him. And many people that had these have talked the same. Now over the years, the Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, and Mark IV, minor differences. They changed slight things where they had uh, loaded chamber indicators, things like that. But the basic design of what Ruger called the standard, that's the basic design. And it shoots very well. So let me shoot a little bit for you. Okay, I've got a playing card put on that board down there that I shot at with my 62 Pocket Police, uh, Pocket Navy the other day. Let's see how I can do with my eyes on this time with my 22, and let's just see what it does at uh, 7 yards. You wouldn't believe the glare on my viewfinder. It's just horrible, the glare on this thing. And at times it makes it where I cannot see what's on the screen. All right, there we go. You pull back to charge the weapon. Let's see how the king's doing. Okay, I don't think his majesty's doing real well. I got one hit right there. One hit right there and the rest are right there that my thumb easily covers it. 
Not bad for an old guy. Not bad for a blind old guy. Now that's the advantage of the Ruger. It was a rugged, reliable gun. It was an accurate gun. It locks back on the empty so you know you're empty and you could release the mag. Reload it and it has a, mag, a uh, slide release right there that allowed you to get right back. It's got a safety right there. There was tons of grips available, tons of sights, accessories, etc. You could get it in the thin barrel, you could get in the heavy barrel. Thin barrel was very light and handy to carry and didn't weigh much. Heavy barrel was better for target work because the weight hung on target and didn't move around as easy because it was heavier. So that's the reason a heavy barrel was preferred for long range target shooting. And there's been a scad of bunnies and rabbits and things taken with this gun over the years. So it was a very desirable gun. The breakdown is you've got a little, like that, that little depression right there you pull out and the mainspring and everything comes out of the back and the bolt came out of it so you could clean it all the way through. It was easily maintained in the field. And the price point of this was below that of those Smith & Wesson kit guns and things like that. So you could have an automatic with 10 shots, accurate, reliable, for less money than buying one of the kit guns from Smith & Wesson or Colt. That was kind of the thing that kind of pushed them out of the market and made it where it was too expensive to get it and shoot it. Hope you enjoyed this video, guys. If, there, if you've ever had a kit gun or ever had a Ruger, put it down there in the comments. Tell me what you thought of it. I've had probably two dozen over the years, off and on, where I've had all the different styles and designs, and I would love to find somewhere one of the standards, the first model, Mark I, and the old tapered barrel where it looks so much like a Luger. I'd like to find an old one like that and fix it up just because I'm an old guy. I know people that's got the new model right now and they're in love with it. So it, it's kept its quality over the years and that really impresses me. Like I said, love to hear from you. Put a comment down there for me if you can and hit that like, share, and subscribe button before you go. And thank you very much for supporting my channel. Till next time, guys, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.